The people we met at the border crossing of Adre, fleeing from Sudan into Chad, interpret their plight as follows. History repeating itself. 20 years ago, many witnessed what's described as the first genocide of the 21st century in West Darfur. Now at the same border crossing, the same question. Which of my brothers, which of my sons are still alive? Two neighbours from El Janena, the capital of West Darfur, just happened to meet. Hadia just arrived. Hawa going back in. She tried to grab the gun of the rapid support force fighter who had shot dead one of her brothers. The RSF fighter struck her on the head and shot her second brother, but he survived. Her surviving brother is seriously wounded. She's going back in to try to get him out for treatment. And with a small piece of bread for sustenance, Hawa walks back into hell. Hadia is going in the opposite direction. Most of her children already escaped West Darfur with her sister two weeks ago. She's bringing the rest of the family and her possessions out. Reunion is coming. Hadia first travels through the border camp. Every time there's a flare-up in violence in Sudan, just across the border, there's a rush of refugees into Chad. This is one of the main access points, Adre, about 2,000 people a day arriving here. And just to give you a sense of the scale, when we were last here three days ago, none of this camp was actually here. Hadia continues her journey through the town of Adre. Virtually the entire population of El Janina is here, the majority from the African Masali tribe. They've been outgunned by the rapid support force and Arab militia, who are systematically destroying their neighbourhoods. Hadia and her family have stared down the barrel of those guns. Hadia's sister has been waiting for her out on the road. Hadia's children and extended family are squatting in an abandoned house in Adre. There is a moment in the life of a refugee, a moment to register your survival, to reunite with what makes you human. This moment. Hadia's extended family is made up of five individual families, all living in this yard. The husbands, either still in El Janena, missing or dead. There are layers to this conflict, but Hadia and her family say they were targeted because of their ethnicity. Around the corner of the building where the El Janena authorities are living in exile, we met one of the most senior mass elite figures from the region. Because what's happened in El Janena, because 100% this is a genocide. For the Masalid is in a group, 
And uh, why are you so? Why do, that's a very specific word. Yeah. Why why do you use it so readily? Because the the number of the deaf people in Algenena is very big. If you compare with the, any other area in Sudan, the war started between SAF and RSF. But the, what is happening in Algenena, this is completely different. 5,000 has been killed from the Masali tribe, from the other tribe also. Ethnicity is the lightning rod, but land and resources are, as before, at the heart of the conflict in West Darfur. One of the differences compared to last time, RSF and Arab militia are armed to the teeth, complements of mercenary and mining money. Weapons, they're turning on people like Hadia's family again. And um, so I'm going to ask you all a difficult question, which is this. Can you put your hands up if either your father or your brother is either dead or missing? What these women experienced, both in El Jinena and on the road out, is hard to talk about. And words don't always do justice. Sometimes it's left to the look in a person's eyes. And so we turn to one of Hadia's daughters. Her name is Bara'a. In English, that translates as innocence. Horik O'Brien reporting there from Chad. Well, joining me now from Geneva is Mukesh Kapila. He was the UN humanitarian coordinator in Sudan in 2003 when the conflict in Darfur began. Mukesh Kapila, you saw firsthand the last genocide unfold in Sudan. Do you worry that we're witnessing a rerun of what happened 20 years ago? Yes, indeed. Watching your uh, package and recalling my own memories from El Janina, which uh, I saw with my own eyes what happened in 2003-2004. Uh, uh, what's happening now is has got all the signature uh, uh, characteristics of, uh, of a genocide. It, it is ethnically targeted against the Masalit, who were the victims uh, all those years ago. And the nature of the violence being committed, the mass atrocities, and in a systematic way, identifying the Masalit and killing them and then burying them, uh, all points to a degree of command and control, which says to me that it is not a random violence, which is going on in, in unfortunately, only uh, too much of it is going on in Sudan, but this is a premeditated and organized attack on uh, people of uh, African origin in Darfur. In other words, a repeat. So do you find it frustrating then that, you know, today we have the news that a mass grave has been discovered, um, yet the, it's believed that the people there were killed last month. Only today do we hear about it from the UN. Is there a frustration there about the kind of lag in reporting on what's actually happening? Well, the UN, and I speak uh, as a person who's worked in the UN for many years, as being the UN coordinator in Sudan, it's uh, always very cautious and uh, it always uh, speaks too late. It's one of the reasons why no UN action is ever uh, preemptive mm -hmm. and why we have never actually succeeded in preventing any genocide. Even when I spoke up all 20 years ago, uh, it was the job was already done. All we could do was to pick up the pieces. And now the UN is calling for uh, inquiries and investigations and so on, apart from the practical issue of how is this going to be done, it also raises doubts. It says, well, we actually uh, don't know what's going on, therefore we need an investigation. And so the genocide can run away, uh, happily committing their crimes. And is there a, 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 an issue as well that the people responsible for the last genocide weren't properly held accountable? So that sort of overshadows what is happening now. Oh, absolutely. What happened was that even though various processes happened, Security Council resolution, refer to the criminal court, indictments and, and such like, it was a half justice. 
and uh, not there was no real accountability. And what that meant is that the perpetrators have got empowered and encouraged over time. And of course, uh, their copybook, as I observed from your report and other uh, other reports, is a is is a copy case of uh, what they did uh, before. So in that sense, we should not be surprised by what's going on. The question really is, what can we do about it? And this is the more frustrating than the UN slowness in being able to call it a spade a spade. Well, what's your answer to what we can do about it and what the consequences are in terms of instability in the countries around and, of course, more refugees that the West will notice? I think uh, there are no easy answers because we know the peace processes so far uh, have not stopped uh, any mitigation of, of these types of violence that are taking place. We also know that there are a lot of vested interests in the region. I think what we can do is not worry so much about Sudan, but more about the Sudanese people. Mm -hmm. Make sure the borders are open. They should, as many of them as possible can lead, especially in Darfur, which is so far away uh, that uh, it is often out of our, out of our minds so that one day when the country comes to its senses, they can return. It's yeah. so the humanitarian considerations are most important now, because I'm afraid we are not able to prevent the uh, violence that's unfolding at the present time. Mukesh Kapila, thank you very much for joining us.